Thanks very much, and, and thanks for joining me. Um, as Barbara said, I'm a pediatric vascular neurologist, and I will be talking about cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is actually mostly a pediatric vascular disease. The cases I will present to you are uh, cases of adults. We'll see um, this is a disease that affects children uh, more often than it does older folks. Sorry, so um, so I, I wanted to start by presenting a case. This is a patient that I saw um, long ago as a resident, um, 73-year-old left-handed man who woke one morning with a severe uh, vital headache and vomiting. Uh, driving a couple of days later, so the headache persisted, uh, he just thought it was uh, basically just a headache. While driving a couple of days later, he noticed that he was unable to read street signs. And uh, this concerned him, but he still didn't seek medical attention for another couple of days um, when he came to the hospital with persistent headache and, and the complaint he was unable to read. Uh, arrived in the emergency room, his uh, physical nation was uh, essentially unremarkable and spinal signs were normal. Um, there's nothing uh, abnormal in general physical exam. He did have a very uh, unusual neurologic examination. So he had right superior visual field cuts, alexia uh, without agraphia, meaning uh, inability to read, but he could still write. Ms. Agnes on looking toward the left, um, the tremor in the left hand, um, this incoordination or dyscytochrokinesia um, on the left, and unsteady ten gait. His labs were all normal, and he uh, then underwent brain imaging, which I will um, review with you. non contrast type CT. Um, there's normality in the posterior fossa. Um, arrow uh, in the bottom right, sorry, in the bottom right image is uh, pointing to the abnormalities. So um, in this case, it's important to compare uh, the left and right sides. So this is the uh, at the left side, and you can see a hypodensity in the location of the left transverse sinus, which is not present on the opposite side, the right. And uh, went on to have an MRI, which showed this extensive um, signal change in the left cerebellum, uh, which uh, is uh, just adjacent to that, uh, that hypodensity that I showed you on. The CT. Retrospectively, um, you can see also the, the uh, hypodensity on uh, CT in the left cerebellum. So you can see that the uh, foliae are a little bit hypodense here. Here, uh, the, the, uh, the cerebellum on the left is hypodense and perhaps a bit swollen compared to the right as well. Um, this is a little bit more subtle a finding than it is on the MRI. On the MRI, you can see uh, in this image, a very bright T2 signal throughout the left cerebellum, lining the folia in a more superior cuts. And you can see this um, signal abnormality in the location of the left transverse sinus. So this is the normal appearance of the transverse sinus on the right. So on, on this image, it appears as a uh, essentially a flow rate, and on this image, it's, um, it's T2 hyper intense. This, uh, just to compare to the CT, these are more superior cuts on the CT. And what you can appreciate is that uh, even outside the cerebellum, in the rebrum, um, some uh, signal hypointensity predominantly affecting the white matter in the, in the uh, left occipital lobe. So here's the cerebellum. You see some hypodense signal abnormality here. In the adjacent left uh, occipital lobe, there's, again, uh, hypodensity and, and perhaps a little bit of edema that you can appreciate. It's hard to appreciate the edema on, on CT, but but clearly this, um, especially the white matter signal, is darker than it is on the on the other side. This is uh, continuing to go superiorly. Again, this is a fairly extensive um, signal change, and what you can see here, uh, it's a little bit subtle, but here is an area of hyperdensity. Um, which actually uh, corresponds to hemorrhage within the uh, within the left uh, occipital lobe coming up uh, into the temporal lobe. 
um, view the corresponding MRI cuts, again, you can see uh, now much more distinctly the um, T2 flare hyperintensity corresponding to edema in, uh, in the left occipital and temporal lobes. And here, uh, coronal slices on the CT which demonstrate the same. And here, what I pointed out with the red arrows is this, um, this abnormality that I wanted to draw your attention to, which is a hypodensity in the location of the uh, of left transverse sinus. So you can see this fairly uh, clearly defined hypodensity um, surrounded by um, hyperintense signal on the CT, whereas it's absent on the other side um, in a succession of slices. So it's, it's uh, the hypodensity is present on multiple uh, coronal CT slices on the left and absent on the right. And again, you can see this um, hyperintensity uh, in the in the left cerebellum. And I think maybe on in this series, it's a little bit easier to appreciate that the left cerebellum is relatively enlarged compared to the right. Um, this is a coronal um, eye, uh, just for comparison. You can see that uh, there's edema affecting the left cerebellum, um, and uh, you can see this, um, this again, this uh, a similar appearance of the left transverse sinus on, on MRI. Um, you can see uh, fairly well outlined uh, the right transverse sinus. And um, the patient went on to have a CT venogram uh, because of the abnormality in the transverse sinus. And the, the, the pertinent finding on the CT venogram is that the, there's an absent filling of the left transverse sinus. So this is a little bit, um, I think some of the images may be a little bit difficult to appreciate, but um, on this one you can see it best that he, here's the, the right transverse sinus, which fills normally with contrast. And uh, the left transfer sinus fails to fill the contrast. Um, as you look at first slices, what you uh, notice particularly is this congestion of, um, of veins in the left cerebellum and the left occipital and temporal lobes. So this is the normal appearance of uh, the venous phase in the on the right side in the cerebellum and the temporal lobe, and there's normal venous drainage. On the left side, what you can appreciate is that there are these uh, additional sort of uh, tortuous and congested veins represent uh, intravenous drainage. This is a reconstruction of the CT venogram that I showed you earlier. And, uh, on, on this reconstructed image, um, the projection is much easier to appreciate that the transverse sinus uh, doesn't really fill. There's some reconstitution in the jugular vein, probably through all of these collaterals that I showed you on the, this image. Um, the right transverse sinus fills normally in veins into the right jugular vein. Uh, I'll review the, the rest of the anatomy of the venous sinuses in just a moment. And see through successive slices that there really is no feeling of the left sinus on the contrast sonography. Um, but again, between um, CT and MR images, again, just to compare the signal characteristics, these, these well acquired roughly contemporaneously. The uh, same uh, phase of the, of the injury about uh, five days after. After um, the initial symptoms, you can see on MR susceptibility weighted imaging that um, there's an uh, abnormal uh, susceptibility artifact again in the location of the left transfer sinus, and uh, it sort of um, also tracks into the uh, um, uh, adjacent uh, structures. So there are these sort of linear structures. In, um, in the same uh, vascular territory. This, this uh, uh, is not the tertiary sinus, but it's, it's, uh, it's formed within the, same, uh, within the same vascular territory. And that could represent um, slow flow of venous blood or it could represent thrombus. This is a time of flight MRV, so a magnetic resonance venogram, which relies on. Um, 
looking at the uh, flow of blood through the sinuses. So this is a non class study, um, time of flight. And it essentially shows the same uh, finding. So so there's there's normal flow through the right transfer sinus into the right jugular vein. Um, but uh, no flow through the, the left transfer sinus, and in this case, you don't see uh, flow through the jugular vein. Um, we see that on the contrast CT, it reconstituted, but uh, on the MRI um, in this time of flight method, because of the slow flow of blood, that it doesn't um, doesn't appear as as um, or no. So this patient went on to have a, a laboratory workup that was notable for an elevated D-dimer, and um, one clinical correlate to be aware of is that a vast majority of patients with sinus thrombosis have elevated D-dimer, even when their only neurologic presentation is, is headache. Um, that is an important um, uh, clinical piece that, that can be used to correlate with or perhaps direct the uh, um, decision to proceed with an imaging study. Uh, he did uh, eventually have a full hypercoagulability workup and was found to have a genetic risk factor for clot formation, which is a profound gene mutation. Uh, in these cases, we often look for um, explanations as to why, uh, why the patients um, form the thrombus. Um, so one would be a, a genetic risk factor, another would be an environmental risk factor like dehydration which, which uh, predisposes to thrombosis. And in older patients, we often look for um, malignancy, um, which can lead to hypocoagulable state. In, in this case, uh, he did not have a malignancy. So the diagnosis was of an idiopathic uh, transverse sinus thrombosis. So what dural sinuses? So those are kind of a neglected uh, structure in, in vascular neurology. We tend to focus on uh, the major intracerebral arteries as a source of disease, but um, it's important not to forget about the dural sinuses and the fact that they also can um, be uh, involved with pathology. So the sinuses are large, uh, valveless, incompletely septated venous structures, which are really um, formed by infoldings of the dura mater. Uh, triangular in cross-section, um, which is uh, important because they have this characteristic uh, triangular appearance on uh, cross-sectional imaging. And um, in into these major vascular channels, which are the venous sinuses, there's a plexus of adjacent smaller venous channels, which act as collateral pathways in uh, case of stenosis or occlusion of the larger sinuses. And the channels that I showed you on that previous CT venogram that we're acting as collateral drain pathways to the cellular vein in case of occlusion of the left transverse sinus um, that exists uh, throughout the um, cerebral venous system. So um, just to review the major sinuses in this in this schematic form, um, the um, there's a superior sagittal sinus. Um, so again, so what you see here is is the the venous sinuses and they're uh, they're depicted as tubular structures, but but they actually have a more triangular appearance. And uh, this membrane here is the fox, which um, just reminds you that the dura mater continues around uh, the outside of the cerebrum and actually forms venous by invagination and, and can be on as a single shape of the fox. Uh, the superior sagittal sinus it provides most of the drainage from the superior portion of the cerebrum. The inferior sagittal sinus, which uh, provides drainage from the, uh, the medial portions um, of the cerebral hemispheres. This um, is the great cerebral vein on Galen, which provides, um, which not depicted here, provides drainage connecting to the deep venous system and the internal medullary veins. Straight sinus, which drains from the inferior sagittal sinus and the, the vein of Galen um, into this uh, um, confluence of the sinuses, which we'll get to in a moment. The transverse sinus, or the lateral sinus, which drains the temporal lobe and the cerebellum. Um, and these, uh, the sagittal sinuses, um, the straight sinus, and the transverse sinuses all come together in this uh, confluence of sinuses. Inferior part of the, the deeper um, uh, cerebral sinuses 
system, uh, which um, which provides collateral drainage uh, into the into the jugular veins. So there's a superior petrosal sinus, the cavernous sinus, the petrosal sinus, and, uh, and the, the sigmoid sinus, which is a continuation of the left anterior sinus, and they drain into the jugular vein, which provides um, drainage uh, back into the superior vena cava. Um, this looks like uh, radiographically on a CT venogram, similar appearance on an MR venogram. It's a little bit less uh, crisply defined than it is in the diagram I showed you. Um, but I've outlined the major sinuses here. Uh, so in the green is the superior sagittal sinus. We see the inferior sagittal sinus um, bringing into straight sinus, the vein of Galen, um, the transverse or lateral sinuses all coming together in the torque. Um, these vein uh, uh, inferiorly to the sigmoid sinus and the both sides. And this is a very uh, image of a, of a CT venogram. Oftentimes, uh, all of the sinuses are visualized, especially if you use, for example, a time of flight uh, or method. Um, images, these axial images show you the pattern of drainage of the cerebral sinuses. So this is important to uh, keep in mind if you see an abnormality, a hemorrhage, or an infarct in one of these distributions, um, that um, it might correspond to the distribution of drainage of, uh, of one of the major sinuses. Uh, it's important not to forget uh, when you see a cerebral hemorrhage or uh, an area of ischemia that, uh, that venous congestion or venous occlusion is a possible explanation in addition to uh, arterial embolus. So major uh, sinuses draining the cerebrum are the superior sagittal sinus, which again drains most of the superior portion of the brain, and the frontal uh, and bridal lobes, um, as well as the occipital lobes for the most part. Um, the, um, the transverse sinuses, which drain the lateral temporal lobes and the, um, sort of meet in a watershed with the superior sagittal sinus, which drains the occipital lobe, and the basal sinuses, which um, really um, drain the sort of inferior frontal lobe and the area around the sylvian fissure. What we see, um, just to, to compare where the, where the infarct was, or the venous infarct or venous, uh, venous it, it really was sort of in the territory of the transversal lateral sinus adjacent to where the superior sagittal sinus drains. Here's the superior sagittal sinus drainage territory. It's mostly preserved. And here, once you get a little more laterally into the drainage territory of the transverse sinus, you see this uh, market um, edema corresponding to congestion. Uh, so I think this would be a good time to break for a moment.